I'm John Enright, I'm the Vice Director or Director of Vice at SIRC, however you want to put it. Uh, and this is our last lecture of the fall semester. I know everybody's working hard, but it looks like we've got a turnout, which is good. Um, Tsuyoshi Tane is a Japanese architect based in Paris. He graduated from Hokkaido Tokai University in 2002 and gained professional experience in London, Denmark, and Japan. He founded Atelier Tsuyoshi Tane Architects in 2017 after co-founding DGT in 2006. He's recognized for a series of award-winning projects and buildings, including the Estonian National Museum, which I hope he shows, which is a pretty exceptional project. Uh, the Kofun Stadium of Japanese Olympics of 2020, and the installation Light is Time, as well as the Todoroki House in, in Valley and many more. Uh, Tsuyoshi is credited with being one of the new generation of emerging architects designing architecture that manifests memory of place as a guiding principle, leading him to develop his concept of archaeology of the future. He's received numerous awards and honors including the French Ministry of Culture Architecture Prize and others. Um, you know, in seeing his work uh, uh, recently and, and talking with him a little bit, uh, he has quite a kind of poetic way of approaching his work. I'm enamored by some of the words he uses uh, to title his projects. Um, this notion of archaeology, of place, excavating towards the future, sometimes paradoxical. Memory, place, space, and time. My favorite, the sound of marble. That's just great. You don't have to do a project, just that's enough. The sound of marble. Uh, archaeology of the future, digging and building. Of course, we would expect someone interested in archaeology to be digging, and I think that comes out in the work as well. Horizontal time, memory field. Uh, these are the words that he uses to describe his work, and I look forward to seeing the images associated with those words. Please join me in welcoming Tsuyoshi Tane to Sire. Thank you, John. <laughs> and welcome to the lecture. And I'm very happy to be in LA for coming to visit. After quite a long time, I came here very often, like between 2013, 14, 15. And so, and uh, today, um, just giving some lecture for uh, introducing some of the work that we've been working on and the for about five projects. And my name is Tsuyoshi Tane, and our office name is called ATA, Atelier Tsuyoshi Tane Architect. So when we started, uh, also like as the young architect, uh, in a sense that the starting of the office is always challenging, but greatly in our generation, we are able to gather internationally to meet different uh, people. And what's greatest thing that being based in Paris as a Japanese architect, but also working to collaborate internationally among the French, Italian, also European, Spanish uh, member, as well as Japanese or Canadians, Americans, so we are happy to have this kind of global point of view to discuss about what we can do for the architecture in 21st century. So we moved to this place, uh, used to be the parking lot. We <laughs> trying to sort of invading this sort of industrial parking lot, turn into the, our atelier for today's situation. So working a lot of for making the models and the challenging to test what we are thinking for making the, our design strategies always being materialized, put our hands, 
working on the physical activities that are important things for our generating the architecture. Since we've been very much into sort of this digitalization to use a lot of computers, computations, and then digital modeling system, but we like to more touch physically by hands and test something the, the machine cannot produce. The idea is, comes from this sort of starting point that it's called Archaeology of the Future. As you can see, the one of the view, uh, it's New York City, and it's one of my most favorite exciting city uh, that I have been visited and always been excited to go back again. And the, probably everybody knows these huge energies and also the strong power of the city, which has been successfully uh, sort of designed at urban development in sort of 20th century, which went around all over the world, especially for the, the in the heart of the city is sort of limited land to produce, produce maximum amount of spaces to pile up in a smaller lot into the higher, uh, let's say, spaces to be built. So in terms of the design development of the urbanities has been developed so far and to sort of losing the origin of the city, but then more quantity of the spaces are raised. At the same phenomena, what happened in the also like 60s and 70s, also the, the uh, people from outside of the city are coming to the city, so there is not enough space to live. So what happened was to sort of expanding the city to be bigger and, or wider and wider. So this phenomenon has been greatly uh, sort of developed in this kind of late 20th centuries. But at the same time, this kind of lost in a sense that you cannot recognize where the city is about. So even these cities may look like one of the large city in Asia or Tokyo, but actually in the Sao Paulo, in the sort of edge of the sort of development areas. And also it may look like the uh, sort of Eastern European cities, but actually it's sort of part of the Shanghai city. On the other side, when you see this sort of the image of the city, this is part of the Paris. But actually, on the left bottom part, which has been sort of been under the, the construction. And when I got into this situation, somehow made me to, be, to question that somehow this kind of under construction land was used to be sort of designed and built this kind of modern building, it was built like a block box. But some reason, this part of the 70s, let's say, box building has been part of the under development, which made me to wonder that somehow I been educated and then also been learned about modernity and modernism was supposed to be the future. But somehow this kind of future of modernism or modernity were somehow being aged, being old, and then being demolished and trying to rebuild something else while other part of the Parisian looking city has been preserved. So this made me to think, what can we make for the future? What, how much we can trust to think for the modernity to promise us for the future to be uh, great. In this case is that sort of way to think how still architects can trust and be thinking for the future somehow made me to think for learning from this archaeology. Because archaeologists go to the place where it's almost nowhere, but start digging and digging and digging to excavate some sort of the, uh, the artifacts, materials, or object which has been almost forgotten or erased or disappeared. But by digging this kind of archaeological site to discover something you have never seen or you have never been imagined what happened in the past from different civilization has been brought it or invented in these places. And this kind of like sort of the archaeological discovery are sometimes so strong that can change the history of the, our, uh, our little histories. 
So this idea of archaeologist or power of archaeology that start makes me to believe that this way of thinking to make architecture, to discover, to change the history can be much more interesting to develop it. So when we start project, uh, making the project, it's not just started to design the building, but actually to start doing this kind of archaeological research, sort of collecting to research, to excavate the meaning of the, let's say, human histories, to be able to analyze and try to investigate what can we bring into the future. So one of the first projects that I would like to speak about, the, the first project for Estonia National Museum, called Memory Field. It started from 2006 and then to be finished in 2016. So this is one of the first image actually showing the sort of historical moment in the 1991, which is called Baltic Chain. So between the, the Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania, which used to be the sort of under occupation, op occupation of the Soviet Union, but they sort of holding their hands over 60, 600 kilometers to be together to hold and the singing to celebrate and then sort of hoping to, sort of, to hoping for the independence from the Soviet Union. And then right after, they got the independence. And in 2005, there was sort of international competition to call for designing the uh, Estonian National Museum. It was one of the most important projects after the sort of independence from Soviet Union. And to think for sort of first national project to be announced and then to call for inter international uh, less Arctic to uh, propose. The site was given in a city called Tartu, which is sort of second large city, largest city after the Tallinn in the, in the capital city of Estonia. And as, it, as you can see, sort of orange marked area was supposed to be given site to design the museum, which is right, uh, let's say, edge of the, the city center. But by uh, looking at sort of the site, somehow trying to imagine for what it could be for designing a museum for the Estonian nation. But discovering sort of left corner, which has been sort of erased, sort of almost round, was left it. Then, like I was wondering, like what this sort of strange kind of blanked land in the corner space was actually the largest sort of the uh, air base which has been made by Soviet Union has been left and they almost, let's say, uh, sort of abandoned this sort of huge land area. So after this discovery of this kind of large, let's say, scarf of the uh, land in Estonia, which has been made by sort of military air base, and which could not be ignored and also shouldn't be forgotten. So we literally expand, uh, sort of idea to extend this sort of large airfield turn into the National Museum to be. The so proposal was so sort of radically, let's say, uh, uh, initiated in a sense to sort of extend this sort of almost negative meaning of the place turning into the National Museum. The building itself is 72 meter wide and then also 355 meter long and to be joining together with the airfield becomes sort of almost 1.5 kilometer of the building or architecture. So this is sort of the, the, the building is sort of slightly inclined from the airfield towards the, to the entrance area. And gently going down towards the airfield to meet in the sort of infinite field land. So when the competition was announced and we sort of, sort of proposing to have sort of entrance canopy to be announced as sort of main gate and the venue to the, to the museum. And also Estonia is sort of one of the northeast countries, so it's sort of, let's say, disappear into the sort of white uh, winter time in the snow. And the building so long, so sort of proposing this, let's say, timeline of the Estonian uh, history and culture to be uh, exhibited, so it becomes the sort of timeline of the exhibition space. 
And that's, that moment in 2006, we also proposed this sort of transformation of the sort of scale. So after exiting from the back of the museum, turning to the sort of military air-based field for the land. So we were sort of proposing this sort of Louis Brodeur spider to be sort of initiating to have a sort of large scale intervention. And also like this kind of negative meaning of the, let's say, military airways turning into sort of Estonian folklore culture to be described or written to be sort of transforming the meaning of the place to be in the layers. And the winter time also like this kind of field of concrete, let's say, uh, airfield towards the building sort of continuously uh, towards looking to the sky, sort of viewing to the future. So miraculously, uh, when I was 26, also with my former partners, that we won the first challenging international com competition to be the winner. And surprisingly, next day, sort of first, our project turned into the sort of cover page of the Estonian national, uh, let's say, uh, newspapers. But even more surprisingly, because of the, our idea of the this military airbase of the uh, field turned into national museum was completely against by one of the historian of the jury members, and she wrote a large, uh, let's say, uh, contesting article about the sort of uh, Soviet Union uh, spider is kind of invading back to the Estonian nations. So we were being sort of attacked by this sort of, let's say, uh, uh, hard criticism from the uh, historian and become sort of one of the hot topic in Estonia and then becomes sort of national debate between sort of whether misunderstood the type of first media uh, being, let's say, went around the countries and also being sort of debated in the next, uh, sort of uh, publicly speaking newspaper and then also like being caricature for one of the honorable, <laughs> honorable memory for the, for the start stage. So suddenly like other young uh, sort of starting project being uh, sort of hardest starting point with the project, but also fortunately the sort of project is signed as a contract and then the client is ready to start from museum side. So this was one of the first visit with the museum, let's say directors, uh, to come on the site to see sort of almost, almost nowhere land to imagine for our future museum. At the same time, also like the uh, misunderstood sort of uh, media's information that we're trying to go around to meet the mayor's minister of culture to explain about the concept of the like, say, project. At the same time, also like this kind of large, such a like large sort of the biggest project, so their interest for the, the uh, contractor already approaching us to say that your project is too expensive in Estonia that you have to really design to change. So sort of this kind of political sort of starting point that has never been experienced in our life as the young architect to be sort of under pressure from this the, uh, uh, the situation. And also like often, like almost every month back and forth from Paris to Estonia to sort of presenting to bring models to explain and they discuss about sort of museum people. In meanwhile, the one of the person, he's sort of the uh, the mayor of the this Tarutus County side, uh, the municipality, and he just approached us to say that oh, I have a dream, because he proposed his dream was sort of putting this idea for changing the city. So our initial idea of this national museum has been here, and then also challenging project of the airfield has been chopped. And then having to sort of presenting this kind of ring road to have sort of four lanes of road to be wrapping around these areas and proposing this kind of golf course and the football court and uh, hotels, hockey halls, shopping centers, and then also supermarket with full of parking. Actually, he is ready to propose all this 3D modeling to say that this is ready and that we want to build next year museum. So he was calling us to say that as if we have to say yes. But uh, as you can see, our faces are completely angry. But behind us, there are also like big investors sort of pressuring us to say yes, you have to agree. 
So we were sort of under pressure for this kind of stressful situation, but also trying to say that no, we don't want to agree for this kind of, let's say, atypical suburban sort of development. So trying to preserve this sort of cultural heritage for the importance for the museum, let's say, future. So we sort of proposing an alternative solution to be able to sort of uh, against their ideas. Fortunately, that time was around 2008, which against uh, like this situation of the uh, the economic large crisis. So all these investors and developers disappeared, and it saved our land. But at the same time, also this lack of the, the financial, uh, let's say, situation for the Estonian uh, countries. So the project has been st stopped over two years and a half, that almost risking two times to, let's say, reject from the uh, European, uh, let's say, cultural investment support, and also like might be losing this kind of a project to be in one moment. Fortunately, 2013, the uh, the government decided to build this museum, which is one of the hope, and then to be able to uh, make this necessary building to be built was important things to take a decision. So over 34,000 square meter of the uh, National Museum started constructing for uh, on the land. They're every month going back and forth to visit the site to check the sort of over the sort of development of the design work with the local, let's say, architect and also local partners to be uh, sharing this kind of situation to build. And there are also 36 months of the construction, so even winter time never means stopping to, uh, let's say, uh, uh, let's say a uh, site never been stopping to uh, construct and then continuously uh, making all the roof to be continuously uh, touching to the ground of the airfield. And then the once building is finished, the one day uh, we were called to come for the site to check the, uh, the facade of the building, which was one of the most important sort of image of the building but actually prepared only the few tiny piece of sample on sticking on the grass, uh, like on the facade. So I went there and then I was alone to be checking the site and then saying that, so the contractor asked me to choose one of those, let's say, glass samples. And uh, in that moment, I was saying that, no, this is too small because our sort of project is over 350 meters long, as well as both sides, which including the facade, is going to be almost one kilometer of one important image of the project, cannot be chosen from this such a small tiny pieces. But then he said that, no, you have to choose, and then I have other samples from my car. So he brought other samples and showing what it could be, uh, the choice to be selected that day. And uh, it was so difficult the moment, there is no more time, and I have to choose. So I asked them to say, okay, wait for one tomorrow morning to see the light is changing, to see the appearance might change. So next day, coming to the site with among the 30, let's say, contractor standing in front of the glass sample that waiting for the choice to be selected. And it's very stressful, and also it's been sort of under pressure that you are the only one person to say which one. And uh, sort of getting almost hard and then stressing what to do. At the end, I was saying that on this kind of left top corner one, it should be the, the facade. So when I said this, sort of this one, to be the chosen one, then suddenly, the sort of after big pressure has been disappeared, and then feel like somehow this sort of important moment to be uh, taking is somehow this sort of being other architect. It's not only to design the building, actually to make a vision of the future, which is one of the most important points that I learned from this moment that you have to choose the future. So after your choice becomes sort of production of the other facade and it's been sort of covering entire the building to be built. 
and this is the oh, sort of 36 uh, months of the construction. So it's time lapse, but it's not working, so I'm gonna skip. But to be built over the uh, 36 months of the construction, uh, it's been sort of completed to be also almost the building is being sort of raised from the field. And then to be sort of after the certain time that all this nature is covering up all this like field of the uh, landscape. So when you come to the approach from the neighbors, like a 42 meter long open canopy to welcome for the people. And the winter time also the, the sun is getting lower to have sort of very beautiful like sunset moment to be welcoming for the visitors. And also that this kind of long building to be stretched and the inclined roof is towards the airfields we meeting. And the winter time become also like covered by completely white up, washed out with the snow. Entering to the sort of the uh, entrance foyer. So we also trying to not design the museum to be sort of the museum as building, but actually trying to make, to maximize the potential use of public spaces. So the multi-public spaces are sort of important place to gather and then to use as sort of not starting direct to the exhibition spaces. So public space can host different type of, type of programs to be able to have sort of restaurant in the winter time to be completely sort of isolated from the, the outer, let's say, environment. And the facade is also sort of seriously uh, printed, sort of the, uh, the motifs of the traditional pattern of the Estonian, let's say, folklore cultures. And also that's the, uh, the museum uh, for the, the, the Estonian National Museum, it's so sort of important to have sort of this uh, crafted work of the uh, wooden pieces to be installed for some certain sort of element in the building. And also starting from the uh, museum exhibition spaces are actually started from the Today's Estonia, which is the first collection was sort of office chair which was the uh, chair with, uh, was seated by the, the founder of Skype. Actually, it was an Estonian person. So the sort of the, the Estonian museum collection started from today's Estonia towards the uh, Ice Age back into the histories. So what more you go deeper and deeper to discover sort of the past nature of the Estonian histories and the life of people. Then when you go back to the building, you discover sort of, sort of then suddenly going out to the airfield, it's almost going to nowhere in the sort of largely cut with the concrete in the middle of the green field. So in 2016 and 1st of October was the, the official opening date for the uh, Estonian National Museum. The president came to start making a speech and they give to celebrate the people for over six hours of the great ceremony for the nation to be gathered and having the sort of celebrity, celebration of the uh, Estonian culture and they're also being used for uh, different type of cin uh, cinemas. So of, already after five years, the, the, the building has been still greatly receiving many people. Uh, before COVID, there was already one million people coming to the, uh, to the museum. And the next project, which is sort of a unique situation, uh, that it's sort of the, uh, the idea that it's been proposed for the new National Stadium of Japan for the Olympic 2020. It's called Kofun Stadium. So as you know, the Tokyo is one of the sort of great large uh, sort of city to be spread over the sort of mainland of Tokyo, uh, of Japan. In the 1964, there was the first uh, Tokyo Olympic has been made and uh, the main stadium has been constructed. So after almost 64 to today that the, uh, the Japan wanted to welcome for the Olympic uh, in Tokyo, 
in 2012 to call for the 2020 Olympic in Japan. So it was very international, large competition to be called and to, uh, let's say, uh, having design competition in Japan. And the main jury was the Tado Ando, other architect. He was asking for the sort of best design for the Tokyo Olympic 2020. And also, like, it was very large scandals, a situation that has been discussed among Japan, so it's in Japanese. But because of what was the problem was the, the, the or what was the scandalous things was that this competition was important for the calling for the best design of the uh, main stadium, but only to be able to participate by having a Prisca prize or RIBA, BA, or AIA, or UIA gold medalist, or at least Imperial Prize for the Japan. So it's only the gold medalist was able to participate for designing the national stadium, which has very, very few number of architects who can try to challenge this competition. And second category was only also uh, you're welcome to participate for the competition if you're able to, uh, if you have been built over uh, 15,000 spectators stadium. But actually it was very obvious that only the sort of, let's say a gold medalist of the architect can participate in this competition. But since they are the young architect, also the uh, one of the main stadium, the Olympic was very important, and also it's been almost, let's say, uh, after a decade, its first large project of a competition, it's been announced. So I wanted to challenge. So going to this kind of the typology of the stadium, it, which is started from the Greek to make this kind of Olympic stadium has been usually, the beginning was excavating the land to create the place to be together for the people to, to make a competition. So in a way that there was no technique to build such a large construction, but actually to excavate, to hold the people to gather in the one place. But in 20th century, sort of this idea of this number of the, uh, people needs to be going to the stadium, which is very impossible to have such a large spectator in the city due to the traffic, due to security. And so this idea of this large stadium um, is always being built in the sort of low density area, more in the outer suburban area, which become a sort of as if like large UFO landed in the sort of field. But the Tokyo had sort of challenged to build again over 80,000 spectators stadium in the middle of Tokyo, which is sort of almost harder challenge to be built. But the site has been actually chosen as a place it's called the Meiji Jingu uh, Gaien, which is, has been also built in the uh, uh, beginning of the 20th century, the, after the, let's say, uh, Meiji Empire has been buried which is what's called Meiji Jingu, which is sort of large, let's say, a forested area, as if an uh, important place to be. So the Jingu Gaian was just almost kind of, let's say, two complementary land for the celebration of the Meiji Empire to be uh, built, uh, to be buried, and then sort of a ceremonic place to be built in this area. So Meiji Jingu was actually built over 100 years project that has actually built at a sort of man-made forest in the middle of Tokyo. This was greatly designed that actually the, the one of the, the, let's say, landscape designer has been built the planning for 100 years forest project, actually greatly successful, uh, successfully done uh, until today. By this project was also like a national project for over around the Japan is uh, young people to gather and also bringing like different trees to plant in this sort of middle of Tokyo. On the other side of this kind of Meiji Jingu Gaien, which was the site of the Olympic Stadium, was actually different period of the, the historical moment has been transformed and then dispatched different land to be used differently and actually lost the meaning of the place. So as you can see, this sort of large field of Tokyo that you see the large part has been sort of forested as Meiji Jingu and then other in different part of the importance uh, 
palace of the empire of Tokyo. But actually in the middle of the land, which is sort of uh, this guy has been almost been dispatched. So idea came in a sense, it's called the Kofun, which is actually an ancient sort of pyramid of Japanese empires, uh, which was made in the six to, uh, sorry, four to six century. And which is, this is one of the largest, let's say, Kokun in the middle of Osaka. But actually, around this kind of fourth to seventh, six to seventh century, around all over Japan from the south to the north, actually over 30,000 pieces of this kind of, let's say, man made pyramid has been, uh, let's say, designed and made in the land. So, idea sort of came into this simple idea for combining this sort of the largest ancient constru construction in Japan to be combining with the largest event of today at the Olympic to be into one. So proposal I was sort of making this kind of large hill like mountain of the stadium to be covered by the forest. Even if you would like to, you can make an effort to go up to the rooftop where you can see 360 degrees of Tokyo life to be around by the top of the stadium. So suddenly this kind of, after 100 years of forest project with Meiji Jingu that trying to continue this idea of this, like let's say forest project in the middle of Tokyo, but actually in the section to be excavated to correct people to be gathering uh, in the middle of the uh, sort of Tokyo uh, stadium. So in a way, sort of having this sort of gathering place to concentrate for the sort of performative space for the Olympic to be served late. At the same time, also this kind of the uh, stadium transform into the sort of football stadium, as well as using this sort of the, uh, the energy resources, which can be also utilizing to collect the water to sort of creating a mist to, uh, let's say, cooling down the city of, let's say, Land, as well as sharing the energy can be also utilized for the massive number of energy which is needed for the only the 60 days per year for the event. And also like making this kind of bringing the forest and to, from the north to the south to gathering to make it this kind of project to be built. And actually this is the, one of the large models that we've been building for the one exhibition in Tokyo. So among this sort of the challenging competition that we've been selected as a finalist among the star architects, such as Sana, Toyoito, and Zaha Hadid, UN Studio among the international architects. Unfortunately, you may know that Zaha Hadid, uh, she won the sort of the, uh, the first prize in the sense that this is one of the strongest uh, project has been proposed and also uh, it's been uh, selected as a, the winner. Of course, it's uh, sort of sadly lost at uh, the challenging project, but actually, uh, surprisingly, uh, in the middle of the stage of the design phases for the Hadid, actually the government canceling her project and then given to the Kengo Kuma for the sort of stadium to be built. And then Olympic has been postponed from 2020 to 2021, so it's been uh, finished for this Olympic. And the next project is going to be a rather small housing project in Tokyo, which is called Todorogi House in Bari. And Todorogi is sort of this small, uh, let's say, uh, uh, land in the middle of the Tokyo area, and also being sort of developed as the, uh, the housing residential areas, areas. And actually this sort of land has been sort of, let's say, buried like a barry in a way that there is a sort of like large river on the bottom uh, of the Tamagawa River and also coming up to the hills. So sort of thinking of this sort of how to design the house uh, in the middle of the city, which is sort of a challenging project how to, to sort of thinking for the future in the middle of the residential areas. But in a sense, to think for this kind of extreme environment for researching for this, let's say, buried hilly area with sort of a lot of humidity from the ground, as well as sort of large windies keep passing in uh, sort of uh, over the trees areas. 
sort of looking at this kind of extreme environment that we can see in our planet, which is called dry and wet. So by looking at this sort of the sort of primitive, let's say, uh, typologies of the architecture as housing and the living place. So taking this sort of one extreme primitive housing in a dry land and also like extreme house typologies in the wetland, to be sort of making a sort of print principal typology to be into one sort of architecture. So this sort of very simple idea of collaging to make sort of superposition or juxtaposition of the dry and the wet type of architecture become sort of very unique, but very primitive, but never been seen before as a piece of housing typologies. And we are so excited about this type of idea to be built and then trying to make sort of model testing. But at the same time, realizing in the sort of middle of Tokyo, which had a lot of regulation to be in the sort of apply other constraints. So at the end, sort of always being tightly limiting the sort of the buildable area and then being sort of chopped into the sort of different small rooms. But we don't want to make it sort of the, uh, the houses to be in a constraint. So we're trying to break this idea of this kind of box type of housing to be more open and living together with the natures. So by testing sort of the idea of concept turn into the model testing to fit in the programs, and then finally making sort of the, the uh, houses to be together with sort of rooms at the tower, to be combined with sort of almost a village turned into the towers, to be also hosting sort of primitive open spaces on the bottom of the houses. So these are sort of structural models turned into the sort of a sketch model of the house and then become the housing and Todoroki. So even middle of the residential area in Tokyo, but it doesn't look like Tokyo anymore. So welcoming sort of this, let's say planting from Todoroki Park and gathering to sort of welcoming around the housing areas. Even from the living room, which is sort of dig down for one meter down to sort of almost buried into the ground and to see the sort of trees which keep growing above your like height. But also collecting sort of excavated, let's say the earth or soil, which is trying to put back into the sort of internal walls or external walls to be using for the, the uh, dehumidifying the sort of moisture and the wet sort of uh, humidity into the ground condition to dry up with uh, this kind of soil wall. And when you go up to the, the uh, master bedroom, which has been sort of in the middle of the, the house, which is surrounded by sort of in the middle of trees, almost almost sleeping the sort of, let's say, uh, covered by the trees. And going to the other side of the master bedroom, there are like this uh, bathroom and the uh, sanitaries. Then going up to the, the last floor for the kids' uh, room, which is sort of almost highest part of the house to see the sort of different perspective and the view of the, the the city of Tokyo. And then when you go out from this kind of kids room to the roof garden of the second floor, which has a sort of continuity to the, the park next to the, the house. So you can see sort of almost the newest house in this neighborhood, but actually it's been almost, doesn't look like almost timeless type of houses to be built. Then the next project, which is rather unique type that it's ongoing project uh, from 2020, and then it's going to be finished in 2025, which is called Urban Structure of the Satahatahatsu uh, project in Tokyo, Shibuya. Which is uh, actually this is sort of small, uh, let's say canal, uh, it's called Tamagawa Josui, which is sort of the uh, important, let's say, uh, canalization to bring the fresh water from the countryside to the middle of Edo, which is the former name of the Tokyo. So to, in order to provide fresh water to drinkable water and to live in a, such a, like one of the largest to city in the middle of uh, Edo was so important. And actually this was uh, initiated and also designed by the two brothers called Tamagawa brothers. 
which is what used to be the farmer, and he has been commissioned and to design this sort of large product for connecting the fresh water from countryside to the city of Edo. By having this sort of this uh, product the, of the Tamaga River, uh, which is sort of uh, Tamaga Josi River, which is sort of brought uh, into the city, but actually after World War II, or also the uh, great earthquake, so this sort of the river has not been used anymore and been buried and been under the concrete already in the sort of today's situation. So do you see sort of the trace of this man-made evolution of the city is being traced and then layered in this sort of history of the Tamaga River. And this is today the situation for the sort of buried, this kind of almost forgotten land. The mayor of the Shibuya came to approach me to say that the, they wanted to design this kind of almost abandoned, let's say, a green passage turned into the high line of New York. Obviously, the High Line of New York, all the mayor, everybody wants to have a new, uh, the High Line today. But you can see sort of almost abandoned, forgotten, let's say, um, a passage, which is very difficult to be regenerated. And then we ask in a way that so to give us a bit more time and to think what we can do. We spent it sort of the months of the studies to think what it could be to utilize sort of more event to create a community for people together. Or to transform different typologies of the sort of, a, could be Copacabana or could be kind of, kind of a, let's say, mountain type of the, uh, let's say, changing to transform the environment. Or it could be sort of inviting this kind of a more zoo or different activities entertaining to animate this land to be used, but not so much into this kind of different ideas. So by sort of keeping to sort of searching for the idea what it could be in the middle of the today's land in Tokyo or Shibuya to look for the future. At the end, it came up the idea called it farm. The farm, it could be the challenging for us to create this sort of continuously changing to transform this kind of the lifeline of the water into the today's lifeline of the farm in urban conditions. Because of this sort of the population is being growing in the city, as well as also the, uh, the growth of the, the generate the, the population, but also decreasing the number of the production of the food in the city. At the same time, also this kind of the uh, global phenomena for bringing the food in the city, and also this kind of the trans tra traveling amount of the energy lost, as well as the day-to-day the -day food loss is so huge for today's situation. What we are eating today is not something like, uh, let's say, relevant anymore for the future. At the same time, also this the urban condition, which is not trying to provide to feed and what we need for the food to be eaten every day's life. So the lack of the future needs of the food is going to be critical to the situation. So in a sense to propose this idea of this kind of farm is bringing the food, but as a farm is bringing the community together with the people. Also farm is also bringing the soil to, let's say, make healthy soil to be great, created by our human, let's say, activities. But also farm is bringing, sort of creating a social ethic to be able to understand and to communicate our, let's say, fundamental basis. So collecting sort of local voices from the citizens around the neighbors and to be able to sort of gathering for the wish to be able to, let's say, involve. But at the same time, also like having sort of different type of the, uh, let's say, going through the sort of city area as a the office typology into the sort of residential areas, areas and also the shopping areas. So it's kind of almost traveling around almost four kilometers of huge continuous land to be designed with the farming, let's say, environment. So including sort of neighborhood, trying to transform to gathering to make it work over the sort of this entire four kilometer project to be turned into the farm. So 
initially we've been proposing sort of let's say the, in the middle of the city turn into the sort of farming land to create the, the, the food by creating communities creating the sort of social uh, communication to be able to have your own food to be produced and also like some part of the built let's say trees are trying to regenerate new type of plants to be let's say following to the older generation to grow so at the end sort of almost the uh, continuous sort of the river of the let's say parade of the food going towards the city in the middle of uh, Shibuya so actually this project is going to be starting construction in 2023 and then by following the phases to be finishing in 2025 And the, the last project which has been prepared over coming to the, uh, to the Los Angeles in the airplane, actually this project, it's been finished just uh, last week to be open in Paris, which is called the Hotel de Malin for the Artani Collection Museum in uh, middle Paris. It started from 2019 and to be open just last week. The, the middle of Paris, is actually the the as you see the, the this image is uh, it's a it's a central part of Paris. It's called Place de Concorde. In the 18th century, the uh, Louis XV, Louis XV, he asked the one of the principal uh, architect of the king called the uh, Gabriello. Uh, he designed this sort of two main building in the middle of Place de Concorde. So Gabriel Ange is sort of designing sort of Concord as well as the sort of the palace of the Louis XV has been built in the 18th centuries. And after that, this building has been transformed into the sort of a, a Navy basis for the building to be used. And then actually last almost 15 years, this building has no, uh, let's say, financial issues to be able to rehabilitate. So it's been almost abandoned and not being used for this kind of long period at the silence. And then the, uh, the Alutani collection, uh, they are the private foundation which collect all this kind of privileged piece of the, uh, let's say, human creation of the civilization from the different period from Mesopotamian to the today's, uh, let's say, artistic cultures. And then one day, the uh, the artist called Hiroshi Sugimoto, and uh, he's also lately doing the architecture at the architect, and he just coming to call me to just join the bid for this Hotel de Malin together with me, because he was called with the, uh, the, the, the client of Artani Collection that he is invited to be coming together to see the, his sort of private museum space. So this is sort of the building that it's been shown as sort of main sort of palace type of, let's say, area. It's been orange or yellow to be marked. And then actually the, his museum is going to be built in the, the blue part. By visiting with Mr. Sugimoto, and he just said that uh, probably I would like to just recommend you, you would be the architect of the museum. And I was very surprised that I was just called to be together with him and coming to the site together to just see with the client. And then just he wanted to introduce me as the architect that could be the potential designer for the, this museum. So suddenly, 2019, uh, the, the diving to sort of this situation to design this sort of 18th century, the, world, the cultural heritage of the Hotel de Malin, to design for the sort of the uh, private foundation for Artani collection to gather all these ancient antiquities and also creation of art pieces of a human being. By looking at how to sort of, let's say, combine all kinds of idea into one project to be built for this sort of somehow contradiction of the, uh, the 18th century French heritage with the sort of, or the collection of the human creative creation of the art artifact into the one space. The wish of the client is sort of designing sort of the, uh, his own, uh, let's say, collection to be able to show at the 21st century museum is a timeless space. 
So idea to start sort of practicing in the sort of one of the entering room is called masterpieces from the Mesopotamian um, pieces to the Egyptian pieces from the also Chinese dynasties. And the second room is called the, let's say, time and cultures, which is sort of having 13 pieces of the head from the different civilization to be exhibited. And then having sort of a great curve, which is sort of defining this sort of this museum into two separate spaces, and then to have sort of other side, which is sort of ancient traveling world, let's say pieces. And plus sort of the last corner would be the temporary gallery spaces, which is constantly hosting different type of the uh, exhibition to be built, uh, to be let's say exhibited. Sort of design this sort of the idea for bringing the different type of museum, let's say permanent spaces for 20 years and to be, uh, let's say exhibited as well as sort of transform into the different type of the, let's say art fact will be exhibited. So in a way to sort of starting point of how to design this, let's say museum, it's always starting from the idea comes as archaeological story to think for this heritage, 18th centuries, of the idea to be continuous. But learning from this kind of discovery that it's called Locaille style, which was invented in France for uh, 18th century, even the Lococo style or Art Nouveau style, this locale style has been invented earlier than those sort of period, actually to sort of designing the motif to be inspired by the organic transformation of the, the dynamics of natures. So this kind of late Baroque period inspiring from the nature was so important to be sort of starting from this kind of before the Art Nouveau Lococo style in France. We've been inspiring to design those locale style into the sort of in let's say, motif to be generating the, the space of the, the light. So this ornamentation of the locale started to cover in this kind of entire universe of the entering for the, the, the masterpiece of the exhibitions. And these are also like the gallery, uh, two image, uh, two spaces for having sort of heads of the masterpieces of the, the different civilization to be exhibited. The temporary spaces are usually needs to have a transformation of the flexibilities, but we wanted to sort of creating sort of 20 years of temporary spaces are only able to change into the showcases to change the sort of scenographic element to be communicated for the, to the exhibitions, but at the same time, the quality of the space stays for 20 years. Then last sort of the kind of great curve, let's say gallery turned into sort of 18 long, uh, like 18 continuous meter of the, the large uh, glass showcases. Even first time ever that we trying to design the sort of each uh, showcases, which is sort of complete uh, permanent, say uh, collection, uh, let's say uh, vitrines as well as also lighting system, as well as the security system to be integrated at the highest performance of the showcase design. So when we have been designing these kind of pieces as one sort of prototyping in Italy and to be able to sort of uh, design it. But at the same time, so this kind of sort of the um, idea from the client side that it's sort of creating a sort of timeless uh, let's say idea to be built. So we invented sort of with the Italian company to open the showcase, which is supposed to be the film. It's kind of pushing up entire glass to be able to open up. So basically when you see the showcase, you, have never, you cannot find any sort of a joint or opening system, actually all the showcase is going to be lifted up to be open to take out the object to be changed. 
And also the construction started from this kind of a historical monument, monument that you cannot imagine how complicated working in France and the working on a historical building, which was having a lot of pro problems. So one of the problems was sort of facing our sort of starting point, finally starting construction. The first thing that has been coming back to say that actually our seamless idea of the floor was supposed to be the huge terrazzo to be covering entire surface be no joint, seamless, let's say, one surface was not impossible. So because of the, the old structure in wood, it's sort of creating this sort of defect for the the the, the for to be, let's say, needed to have a joint everywhere. So it was discussed a lot and then trying to invent with the Terrazzo company to be able to sort of flexibility to be able to have potential use of the no joint, but at the same time to keep the idea from the origin. But actually it was impossible to make it work. So at the same time, we have no choice to change the idea. But learning from this idea from the the uh, historical monument actually started from Versailles. Was actually the Versailles was used to be everywhere stone floor, was also having a lot of troubles, a lot of problems, which was cra cracking all the stones. So that stage, the, uh, the, they invent sort of the flooring typology is called Versailles Parquet, Parquet Versailles, which is sort of pattern of Versailles, which is sort of creating sort of typology of the composing the the, the flooring into the sort of beautiful pattern to cover entire, let's say, flooring system in wooden construction. So learning from this Versailles parquet, which was also used in the, our Hotel de la Marine, let's say, flooring for the Louis XV building, which is sort of a continuous, seamless, let's say, pattern into the, our, let's say, museum spaces. But at the same time, using sort of uh, this uh, granite that the mob, uh, stones to be covering, also volcanic stone to be covering, to have a gradation of the color changing. In the sense that in that stage, in the 18th century, could not be able to do this floor type in stone, but then continuously using, let's say, Belisai pattern into stone typology could be also invented in 21st century that we could make it. And at the same time, all this kind of a huge construction that was showcases one of the highest performance to be have, having sort of, a, let's say, ensuring for the quality of the, of the, uh, the object to be, let's say, secured, and also the temperature, humidity control. And also the building, let's say, uh, each pieces in uh, Italy uh, to have almost, let's say, a military meter of the, let's say, joint to be checked. And having sort of the uh, construction site in order to have sort of, let's say, a place to be built and then start producing all the first master room to be able to create sort of this uh, local style of galaxy into the space to be constructed. So preparing for over 30,000 pieces to be installed with full of lighting programmation to be an animate entire space to be composed. And also like having this sort of gallery space are everywhere to be covered by stucco, which is one of the important technique that we wanted to continue to have sort of human, let's say, creation of by using a handwork, craft work to be able to cover entire surface to be. And also you can see the showcase was not able to have any doors, which is almost <laughs> hard for the construction guys that they have to enter to the showcase to construct inside. They finally, they, when the work is finished, they can go lift up and to go out from the showcase to be. So finally, this sort of the uh, this is the uh, the photo has been received uh, yesterday, and then just showing it the first time in the publicly here to show the entering to the first room for the masterpieces, having the the seven pieces of a chosen collection from the the our client and then displaying for the tiny pieces of the great masterpiece that you can really face and then see the object inside of the showcase also showing this sort of all this ornament of the 30,000 pieces surrounded by entire less experience for immersive type of the entering to this sort of first encountering to the masterpieces of the Artani collections 
and going to the gallery two spaces, which is also entering to the sort of 13 pieces of the heads from different civilization. The one of the first, uh, let's say, piece, which I was also very shocking to see the almost 4,000 years of head from Mesopotamian in front of you. It's almost you can touch and you can really see the work that's been just in front of you. Then having all these kind of Mesopotamian Egyptians, like Maya civilizations, even Africans. So to see sort of different civilization from different time into the one sort of unique experience to be installed in the showcases. And the next gallery is going to be the sort of temporary gallery exhibition, which is sort of first exhibition, exhibition was dedicated for the, um, let's say, Islamic art collection pieces, which is sort of gathering in a way to have sort of composing different type and then unique experience to be displayed. Then going back to the like, let's say the gallery four spaces, which is sort of continuous four, uh, 18 meter long, let's say seamless uh, horizontal gallery to be showing different piece of the traveling ancient culture by seeing different piece of the collection to be. Then actually going back to the sort of one of the first welcoming for the masterpiece uh, collection room to be entering to back to the, to the beginning. So at the end, the, to sum up the idea of the project that you see from the large Estonian, uh, let's say, uh, museum construction to the tiny house of Tokyo, to the, let's say, uh, heritage museum in, uh, in middle Paris, which is almost completely different, but at the same time, the importance to have this idea of memory of the place and space and time. Because you know this idea of the place, and you know idea of the space, which is sort of somehow very similar, but actually completely different. But it's hard to sort of identify where the space comes from the place, or how to find a place in a space. At the same time, the importance for this time and the memory that you know very well. But actually, it's also difficult to find a way that how to find a memory from the time, how to memorize when you, have a when you are in a sort of frame in time, or how to measure the time and sense of, the sense of time into the memory is very hard. But trying to think a little bit deeper in the sense of how to think of it in a place is called singularity. The place is a singularity that you cannot find any other place in the world. It's a place, it's only one exists, it's only the place that it cannot be replaced, which is a singularity, it exists only one place. But the space is infinity. The space can be produced and it can be also multiplied. So as in the beginning of this sort of lecture that's been pr uh, presented in the sense that the space in the middle of the city can be also, let's say, built and then let's say, increase number of spaces. Or even this kind of lecture hall can be having a wall to be divided to two spaces or four spaces or eight spaces. So space can be multiplied or even divided to be infinity the number of spaces can be produced. And the time is the idea of the continuity. The time is never been stopped. It's always continuously, let's say, never been stopped. So even the, the, the every year or every second, the, we try to, let's say, separate time to be identified, but actually time never been stopped. Time is keep continuing. This is the idea of time. And the memory is about collectivities. The collectivities, in a sense, for the memories are the collective memories. So it's not a singular memory, the personal memory, actually, the, the memory is always being sort of important to have this collective memory which has been made in human history and human sort of nature, which is important to have continuity for this kind of human memory to be. So without the memory, we will not be able to have a sort of future. And what we call the architecture is always this between the idea of the place and the space and the time and the memory into sort of let's say, synchronize into the one piece of architecture, which can be go beyond the building. It becomes the architecture as sort of importance for the future. And thank you very much.